Founded at the beginning of the UK lockdown, A Bit Lit is about conversation, celebrating and exploring theatre, literature and creative work across all periods and of all kinds. We've talked to professional wrestlers and about Ghostbusters and medieval sex positivity. We've looked at the histories of race, gender and sexuality. We followed migrating coconuts and the history of wine and cheese. We've gone from Jane Austen and Shakespeare to EastEnders via the history of early television, young adult fiction, photography, animation and documentary making. And with over a hundred films already, many other subjects as well. Join the conversations at our website, abitlit.co or on YouTube and follow us on Twitter at abitlit. Bodhi, hello, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks, Andy. How are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm really good, thank you, and delighted to have you with us. Um, we start our films by asking contributors to introduce themselves and tell us a bit about their work. So would you mind doing that, please? Yeah, absolutely. Well, hi, everyone. Um, I'm, I am a doctor. I'm Dr. Bodhi Ashton. Um, I'm an Australian, as you might be able to tell or you might not be able to tell. Um, so I tend not to use the title all that much. I work and live in Germany, so that's always a little bit of a... A thing here as well the Germans are a bit more formal with their titles so there's often a bit of confusion when I'm like just call me Bodhi. Um, I'm a historian um, as I say I'm from Australia I was trained in Australia but trained in German history um, and I did my PhD uh, in Australia in modern German history of the 19th century um, and I then moved sort of more into the history of identity sort of very broadly defined how uh, individuals create their own identities, how they present their own identities and how they then form communities and how in turn they form that sort of communal identity as well. So a lot of my focus is based on Germany because that is the the um, basis of my training. And of course I live here, so that, that makes it quite helpful. Um, but I've sort of over the last few years been expanding that, that portfolio a little bit further. So. Um, I've been working for the last few years in a law faculty in southern Bavaria as, as a historian and a researcher there, and I'm just about to take up a new position in Erfurt um, as a postdoctoral researcher and lecturer. Yeah, congratulations on my new job. That's really exciting. What, what are you doing in that, in that new role? So I'm actually working on a uh, project that's got third party funding, so through the Volkswagen Stiftung. Um, so they don't just make cars, they actually give us money to do historical research, which is fantastic. Um, so I'm working with a colleague of mine, Ned Richardson Lessel, um, and we're looking at, uh, the, the project itself is called The Other Global Germany, and it's basically looking at Germany in the 20th century as a focal point for sort of a globalized idea of criminality and criminalization and so-called quote unquote deviant behavior. Um, so we're kind of, it's Ned's project, it's Ned's baby, and I've been taken on as a, a postdoctoral researcher for that. Um, so I get to contribute to that and then focus on my own project in the meantime as well that falls within that, that confine too. Okay, great. Well, we might come back to that in a moment then, if that's okay. Thank you very much, Bodhi. Um, I'm going to start with a really big and also probably really stupid question, which is my speciality, for which apologies. Um, but you talked about your your kind of initial research interest being around uh, individual identity formation. And I guess someone new to those ideas might say, surely an individual already has an identity in order to be the individual. So how how can how can an individual form their identity? Do you, do you mind telling us a bit more about that, perhaps with specific reference to your, your research interest in 19th century Germany or, or not, as you wish? No, I'd love to, um, because that was basically one of the reasons why I ended up branching out a bit further. The, when I started work on my PhD, I was very much thinking I'm just going to do German history, like German history is German history is German history, and I'm going to do something in the 19th century, and it's going to be a little bit different because I'm going to look at one of the southern states, um, so one of the smaller states of Germany, um, so I'm not going to focus on the big power broker Prussia, and I'm definitely doing nothing about the Nazis because every man and his dog does something about the Nazis. And this was my, my entrance to my PhD. So I hadn't really thought about that at all. But once I started getting into it, there were really interesting questions here that are basically about, well, how does, I mean, Germany only forms in 1871. 
And especially for someone like myself from Australia, you know, we Australians look at our country in the way that it exists now. And we constantly think of it as being a very young country and leaving aside any other um, questions with that, the Commonwealth of Australia is formed in 1901. Well, Germany is only 30 years older. And yet we look on Germany as being this thing that's existed for so, so long. So the first question that came about from this, so I was looking at the, the kingdom of Württemberg, and the question was really, how do Württembergers suddenly decide at some point, or do they suddenly decide, well, actually, we're Germans. We're not just Württembergers, or we're not Württembergers, but we're actually Germans. And then looking at that a little bit further, because then I sort of got into the question of, well, what does it mean to be a German, and what does it mean to be a Württemberger? And then breaking that down even further, we then run into questions of, well, how far do people actually look upon themselves as being Württembergers bound to their state? Because this state itself, in the way that I was looking at it in the 19th century, is also a modern construct. It doubled in size and population during the Napoleonic Wars. And you have these people, the so-called new Württembergers, who are suddenly within the state and are suddenly supposed to identify with us when what they had previously belonged to virtually overnight no longer exists. And so this was really the question that, that stuck in my mind throughout the work that I was doing, which was how do you deal with this idea that what we might take as a given, and we have to remember that the idea of the, the nation is actually a fairly modern idea. Um, so it's very, it's, it's almost reflexive of me to go, well, I'm an Australian. But how likely is that for someone at the beginning of the 19th century, they're probably not going to say I'm an Australian, but um, how likely is it for someone to say, well, I am a Württemberger? And if they do, what does that actually mean to them? Does it have a, um, a, a basis in a communal ritual? Does it have a basis in what sort of work they do? Does it have a basis in their religious confession? Does it have a basis in what sort of a uh, form of language slash the form of dialect that they speak. Um, all of these sorts of things all build into this question of what it means to be a Württemberger, what it means to be a German. And so these all have to reconcile with one another in some way, shape or form. And the more I went through this and was working on my PhD that then became my book, um, basically this question just became bigger and bigger and bigger in my mind because the more I came towards an answer, the more I felt like I was getting further away from an answer as well, that this just became infinitely more complex. So that's really the, the thing that's drawn me in for this. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's a really lovely kind of um, adumbration of the various things that you might kind of posit your, your identity on, work, communal ritual, religion and language. And I guess perhaps you'd also be thinking not just in terms of what, what do I have and my local community have, in connection with these things but also how am i different from the people over there in that in that town that district what have you um what, what are my religious cultural um linguistic differences and uh, i presume that would also be a big part big part of it yeah like there's a, a really lovely um example of this that comes from this uh i mean it's it's called in its english version the diary of the napoleonic foot soldier um and it's often used as a text for, for historians who are focusing on, on the Napoleonic Wars. And it's really interesting because it focuses on a um, soldier who is drafted into Napoleon's Grand Army. And he's from Württemberg, actually. Um, he's from, if, if I remember correctly, he's from Ludwigsburg, which is the seat of the, the House of Württemberg. Um, he goes off, he fights, he's wounded, and he's brought back home. And on his way home, he's passing through states like Saxony, for example, which nowadays is obviously an integral part of Germany. But it feels very, very different to him. It's, it's so foreign to him. And then he arrives in Württemberg and travels through Stuttgart, which is the state capital and is not far away from Ludwigsburg at all. And this also feels like a foreign city to him until he gets home to where he, of course, is from. And this suddenly, the, the fact that he himself is, I believe, a Catholic as well when Württemberg is sort of half-half um, 
and Stuttgart itself is mostly a Protestant city. Um, so the fact that, you know, in the space of what, 20, 30 kilometers or something like that, this, this idea of what is home has shifted um, or what is very much not home is now suddenly home here in the space of that, that very short distance. Um, I think it's, it's a fascinating thing, this really weird idea and, and wonderful idea at the same time, I think, of where we feel we belong and why we feel we belong. Yeah, thank you. That's really fascinating. Um, for anyone listening who wants to follow up with other films, we made a film with Andrew Smith on the history of wine and cheese production in France, thinking about um, kind of Languedoc's relationship with the rest of France and defining itself as not France. And we're releasing, just before your film comes out, Bodie, we'll have just released um, a film with the theatre historian Miriam Schmiegel, which is looking at um, 17th century English theatre companies touring, in fact, touring the Holy Roman Empire and, and moving from state to state within the Holy Roman Empire. So anyone listening to this who'd like to follow it up, um, those are some films to, to check out. And I guess I am thinking about that kind of long, that long picture as you're speaking, because, you know, I'm listening to you from the United Kingdom, which has its own very deep uh, turmoil right now around the issue of nationhood and sovereignty and thinks of itself as an old country. But in fact, the United Kingdom is only, you know, one century earlier in formation, one century earlier than the German national formation that you're, you're talking about. Um, and uh, yeah, and thinking about the kind of forms of mobility you're talking about, people in Napoleon's army. Um, I wonder if war is a really key driver to that kind of mobility where you have kind of mass mobilization of people um, in kind of pre nationhood forms of cultural identities moving um, east and west across Europe, whether that be towards Russia or towards France. It feels like maybe there's an axis happening there. And then in, in your period, with Franco-Prussian wars, for example, doing something similar. Um, so I'm thinking about, you know, 1870 with um, Ger Germans, if I can call them that, suddenly ending up in, in Paris and the kinds of cultural experiences they might have there. I don't know if that plays part of part of your work. Yeah, um, in my particular, in, in the focus on my particular work that I've done in the past, something like that hasn't quite come up, but it's certainly always in the background. So um, there's this peculiar, there are always these peculiar little connections that you don't necessarily expect. The fact that the Kingdom of Württemberg is very close to the Russians diplomatically because there are dynastic ties between the House of Württemberg and the, the Russian dynasty, the Romanov family in Russia, um, is fascinating, as is the fact that there's this amazing trade in snails between Bavaria and France so France is actually buying what ends up being escargot, um, is buying from the Bavarians quite a bit. Um, and there's all these sort of surprising connections that you don't necessarily expect. And at the same time, I don't want to, I don't want to give the idea that uh, everything is so very static, like uh, people don't just always stay in their little villages and, and whatever. Um, but at the same time, we do have these connections. This is sort of a, a proto-globalized world, but it's not a proto-globalized world for the, the quote-unquote masses. Um, there are plenty of people who will stay in their little villages and never leave. Um, there are plenty of people who will not know the difference um, or will be surprised by the difference if because of a war, for instance, um, and it is a very good reason actually to be moving around places if you get dragooned into an army and you end up being sent across borders. Um, so Maybe see let's it. not call that a good reason. Am I allowed to interject and say let's not oh, call please. that a good reason? <laughs> please. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's not the best reason. <laughs> Sorry. It, it's a good reason to be moving. It's not a good reason to be forced to move. Yeah. So, but yeah, yeah sorry. So, no, no, no. There's, there's a lot of this sort of movement that happens, but it's also very, I mean, we, we, we have a proto-globalized world at this time, but it's not the same sort of globalization as one has now, of course. So um, the reliance on how we know about things comes a, a long way through, um, through cultural exchange, through if you happen to be meeting someone from somewhere else, that's sort of a um, very much a happenstance, but it also comes through folklore and things like that. Um, and this is also another one of those interesting things. I mean, the Brothers Grimm, for instance, in, in Germany, it's a fantastic example here because they're sort of trying to create uh, 
this German brand of folklore. They actually mentioned the Württembergers once, or rather the Swabians. Um, and they have a, a folk story, Die Sieben Schwaben, the Seven Swabians. And basically the story is entirely about that these seven people from Swabia, so effectively the heart of Württemberg, go traveling, but they're so stupid and their dialect is so weird that they end up being confused because they can't, they hear the sound of a frog croaking and they mistake it for the word meaning wade across, as in like to wade across a river. So they hear this frog croaking and they decide to follow this command and end up drowning themselves in the Mosa River. Um, so for something that's meant to be sort of a, a unifying national folklore, this is very interesting that the one mention that we get of the Swabians is that they're dumb and they speak weirdly. Um, <laughs> Yeah, or highly obedient to frog orders. <laughs> highly obedient to frog, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, fascinating. Uh, and again, the Brothers Grimm are doing work around um, Indo-European languages, um, thinking about the kind of prehistory of linguistic roots, which I guess is its own sort of, you know, back, back cultural back formation, perhaps, trying to establish pre the prehistorical underpinnings of, of, of contemporary cultural identity. Yeah. Um, and this, of course, is is very important when we look at the ideas of of how you draw people together. I mean, if we look at the the basis that I had for discussing, you know, what makes a what makes a national or state or communal identity, a national or state or communal identity was looking very much at the works of Benedict Anderson and Anthony D. Smith and, and Eric Hobsbawm, where they're basically throwing in these ideas of, well, the things that draw us together, of course, are things like ethnicity. Well, ethnicity is always a very, uh, a very slippery um, concept to be able to define, let alone grasp for. Um, and ideas of language. language. Language is always very important in that. But that also opens up its own questions as to what is, we can often have a, a a sort of legitimizing basis of language here, but what is the, again, quote unquote, legitimate language that we're talking about? And here, when talking about Germany and German, for instance, there are, there's such a wide range of dialects that we have in this small space. Um, Germany itself is not big. This is also something that, that comes as uh, something of a surprise for, again, someone from my background. Um, Germany fits into Australia 21 times, but has more than four times the population. Um, it's, it's a small space with a lot of people, and there's such an amazing distinction between dialects and just accents as well. It's quite remarkable. So it's also remarkable to look at this sort of idea of, of looking at language as the basis of an identity and then looking at, well, what's done with the, with the sort of deviation from what might be considered the norm of that linguistic identity as well. Yeah, fascinating. And a very good link to where I wanted to go next because you, you tantalised us by talking about your new job within the framework of the project on the other global Germany um, of being around criminality and, and deviance. And um, so far in this conversation, I've had unexpected quotas of snails and frogs, but I have not yet fulfilled my criminality and deviance limits. So do you mind telling us a bit more about that? All right, let's talk about criminality and deviance. Um, that, that sounds more fun than it might be, but then again, let's see. Um, because I have to say as well that when I'm using these terms, criminality, and when I'm using deviance in particular, please imagine giant scare quotes over this. Um, because what I want to get across, first of all, is that what might be considered here in this conversation to be deviant or deviant behaviour um, is considered that in the historical context. Um, so it's not a value judgment from my position or anything along those lines, but it is very much the way in which the language is used itself in the historical context. Um, so again, it's, a, it's about, sorry to interrupt, but again, it's about identity formation. It's about how those concepts themselves, those categories become formed. Precisely, precisely. Um, 
So my particular focus for this project, um, and keeping in mind that it's in the very, very, very early stages at the moment. So basically the proposal has gone off, the, the background reading has been happening, and now I'm sort of sitting here thinking, great, how do I do all of this? <laughs> um, it's, it's always that really nerve wracking bit at the start of every project when you're really excited about getting into it, but you're not quite sure exactly how you're going to get into it to start. Um, it happens eventually, I promise. Um, but my focus for this is specifically going to be on um, queer lives in Germany throughout the 20th century, um, with a particular focus on transgender experiences. Um, and it's going to be following most of the gamut of the 20th century. There's going to be a specific interest in the Weimar period in Germany. So that's uh, from the end or a bit after the end of the First World War through to the rise of Hitler, so 1919 to 1933, um, but also post-war period as well, so post-1945 um, and every other bit of the history thrown in there as well. Um, because what strikes me as being very, very interesting about this and the, the thing that again gave me the, the entry point for this is once again to look at Weimar Germany. There's a lot of discussion about Weimar Germany and a lot of a, a cultural understanding, a received cultural understanding of what Weimar is. Um, if anyone has seen or read any of the um, Babylon Berlin stories, for example, um, this is a very clear indication of how we're meant to conceive of what the Weimar Republic was like. This is a period of, again, quote unquote, debauchery. This is a period of license. This is a period of um, liberality and of anything goes. This is cabaret, effectively. And no more is, uh, there is no more an obvious place to look at that than in queer lives, where we have this incredibly vibrant culture that's growing up in Berlin. And I specify here Berlin um, of very, very open gay lives, um, very, very open lesbian lives, and also a, sort of an undercurrent of people who in the, in the modern vocabulary we would consider transgender. At the time, because that vocabulary doesn't exist, they're most often referred to as transvestites. Um, and this is part and parcel of this, this story that we have of Weimar Berlin, that it is this sort of very, very decadent place and period in time. It's not quite as straightforward as that, as one would expect. History is never that straightforward. Um, the first thing is, the reason I say I'm specifying Berlin is that this is really a story of Berlin, but almost nowhere else in Germany. This is actually one reason why I'm planning on, on putting forward a course maybe next semester or the semester after, which is Weimar Germany without Berlin. Um, because when we consider Weimar Germany, strangely enough, we don't think of the place that's actually called Weimar. The one that it's actually named after, Weimar is its own city. Um, but we don't consider it. Um, what's happening in this period in Munich, for instance? What's happening in this period in Frankfurt or Hamburg or any of these places? But no, our focus is almost always on Berlin. And that's because it is this very sort of vibrant place where people like Christopher Isherwood and so on travel from overseas. There's this, there's this entry point for prominent queer people from outside Germany to come and experience a life that is more open to them than it is in their home, um, in their home cities and countries. There's a great example here of the, the poet W.H. Auden, who was there with Isherwood. And he was on a tram one day with a young lady who kept looking at him and obviously was giving him the eye. Um, and Auden is gay. And Auden also cannot speak German to save his life. But he writes in his diary afterwards, and this comes from Robert Beachy's wonderful book on gay Berlin. Um, he writes in his diary afterwards, 
that he felt confident enough that if she were to actually say something to him, he would reply with, Entschuldigen Sie, Madame, aber ich bin schwul. Excuse me, Madame, but I am gay. Now, this is really interesting, especially because he doesn't see that as being, and referring to himself as schwul, he doesn't consider that as being in any way derogatory towards himself. But at the time, there's no equivalent in English. So the word gay does not exist in this context in English at this time. Um, and the only way he would be able to address himself and his sexuality as such at this time in English would be to use a derogatory term. But he doesn't have to do that in German, and he feels confident in being able to explain who he is in German, a language that he cannot speak. Um, so this is all incredibly fascinating. This is really interesting to, to look at. Um, but at the same time, we have things like this license that we talk about with regards Weimar Berlin is not actually permitted. Um, when we think of the sex trade that happens in Berlin at this time that is ubiquitous in things like Babylon Berlin, or the Philip Kerr novels, or if we watch Cabaret, or anything along those lines. Um, this is still illegal under German law, and people are still prosecuted for this under German law at the same time. Um, the sexual relations between people of the same gender is still illegal under German law at this time, and again, people are still prosecuted. So, what we have is a really odd story where, on the one hand, there is a degree of permissiveness and a degree of license and a degree of, if we want to call it that, decadence. And there is something of a story of joy happening there. But at the same time, there is an undercurrent of this, this, this story of debauchery and this story of deviance and this story of criminality, that these things are not allowed and they're not being condoned. And this is one of these things that I really want to engage with head on here. And one of the great ways of looking at that is going through the experiences of transgender people at this time as well. Because I know I'm talking quite a lot here and hopefully you're not falling asleep over there, Andy. Um, fantastic. Um, transgender people have existed since DOT basically. And this is very much the case in Germany at this time, because at this point, they start becoming more visible. Because as of 1920, Magnus Hirschfeld's Institute for Sexual Research is actually offering the first gender confirmation surgeries in Europe, or in fact, in the world, as far as I understand. Um, and the Institute is also offering the so-called Transvestitenscheine, which are like, they're sort of like licenses that if you go in and you basically say, well, I was, uh, if I use a, a more modern parlance here, if I were to walk in and say, well, I was assigned male at birth, but actually I live as a woman, then you could actually be given a, this, this Transvestitenschein, this license, to say that this is your existence. And this had a really practical reasoning behind it, which was fundamentally because people who could be identified visually as living as women, but having been born in the assigned gender of a man, were very often clocked by the police as being sex workers because the idea was, this is a man in a dress, why would a man be in a dress if not to solicit for sex? And if he's soliciting for sex dressed as a woman, then he's clearly wanting sex from men. Now, these are all things that are against the law. So basically what Hirschfeld's Institute is doing is providing paperwork to be able to show the police to say, oh, no, 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 I'm not breaking the law. I'm not a sex worker and I'm not going to break the law in terms of um, same-sex sexual relationships here because this is my experience. But what this actually consequently does in sort of this weirdly perverse way 
is that it then creates this two-tiered system because people who live as transgender people at this time are actually very often forced by the society in which they exist into going into sex work because of the fact that if they are identified as such, it is actually very difficult by the understanding of society of what the gender roles are at this time for them to do any work other than going into sex work. So what's happening here is that people are going to Hirschfeld and are getting their, their license, their Transvestitenschein, to say to a policeman who stops them, no, I'm actually not a sex worker. And this actually gives them effectively free reign to be a sex worker. While others who maybe can't afford this, um, who are new to Berlin, who simply can't get an appointment and so on, um, they are classified as being sort of this underclass of people here, the, the so-called auch transvestiten, the, the also transvestites. Um, and they are always at risk of being stopped by the police because their experience is not considered legitimate as long as they don't have this particular license. Um, so this was really the, the point at which I thought, well, this is something that we really have to go into um, that is much more complicated than the received wisdom that we have um, of this period and of these sorts of relationships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Bodhi, that's all really fascinating. And a number of things I'm hearing from you there is a kind of gap that exists between the per permissiveness and joy, as you put it very beautifully, on the one hand, and so the kind of cultural permissiveness and joy against a, le a legal um, reality, if that's the right word, a legal context, which is not a big fan of permissiveness or of joy, and also a gap which exists between provincial, um, well, b between Berlin and between and not Berlin in Germany, which again, again itself seems to turn on, you know, the way you open this conversation, which is about the formation of Germany itself, that we've moved from a, a Holy Roman Empire of a collection of different states to a real centralization around a particular urban space in which um, very specific cultural identities are possible, which are not possible elsewhere. And now you're moving us on to another gap um, between queer and trans lives. I'm mindful of the time and I, th I think my, my instinct, if it's all right with you, is to wrap up this part of the conversation but given that you've you told us that this is work just beginning maybe we can get you back in the future um either to hear from the, the project as a whole the uh, other global germany project or from yourself um about your your part of that project um but I'm, I'm very keen to leave time for you to tell us before we wrap up i know you're thinking about editing a book on the pet shop boys and we definitely we can't let you go without hearing a little bit more about uh, about that i mean there's a band with a, an interest and an instinct from, from Weimar culture, right? Mm -hmm. oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. <laughs> um, and this basically comes from the fact that I have grown up with the Pet Shop Boys. Um, I, in, in my household when I was growing up, my brother is older than me, he's 13 years older. Um, and, you know, so when I was growing up, he was just starting to go to some of the gay clubs as well in, in Adelaide and in Melbourne. And of course, Pet Shop Boys were playing constantly. Um, so, and he always had a fantastic stereo system. So, you know, he'd be getting the latest albums and be playing them. And at five years old, I'd be learning all the lyrics already. Um, and so they've just sort of been a constant the, the whole time. And at a certain point, that interest has become a lot more academic as well as I've started looking at it and thinking, well, no, they're not just making pop music. Um, they are, but there's also a, a lot more behind this. And I mean, my first, my first love for history was actually in Russian history and the fact that there's an awful lot of um, Russian historical references that run through their works as well was something that, that piqued my interest. Um, and, I mean, 2020 being the year that it's been, I was sort of sitting around thinking I'd really like to do something about this. And at some point I thought, well, why not? So I've, uh, I've pitched putting together an edited collection on the Pet Shop Boys um, with reference to politics and history um, and have already had a, a few abstracts back in for that so far. The call for papers still goes until February, so I'm, I'm looking forward to... 
to being able to put that together. And already people thinking about this is, is really quite fascinating. But this is another example, I think, of, of just uh, what builds into an identity, so to speak. Um, I've, I've always considered myself a fan of them, and it's only now that I'm really thinking more um, about what actually they do with their music that I realise actually this has a much greater resonance with me than just that. Of course, being a fan is enough, but... Well, I know I speak for many of our listeners, but also just selfishly for myself when I say that we'd love to get you and or contributors back if you want to tell us about that project as it, as it develops, because we'd love to hear more. Um, Bodhi, thank you so much. As I say, I wasn't expecting frogs or snails. I'm delighted to have uh, both of them. Um, I'm fascinated to think about work, communal ritual, religion, language and dialect being a kind of central place from which identity might be formed in 19th century, well, Germany, I suppose the thing which is becoming Germany in the 19th century. <laughs> That's the best way of putting it. Um, fascinated to hear about uh, criminality and deviance in the 20th century and really looking forward to watching um, that, uh, that project develop. Thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. Take care. Thank you. Bye.